I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you for beginning your day with us. Our speaker is the distinguished historian John Lewis Gaddis. Professor Gaddis will be discussing his most recent publication entitled On Grand Strategy. This book is based on his reflections from almost two decades of co-teaching a legendary seminar in strategic thinking at Yale. For more about our illustrious guest, please take a moment to read his bio, which was handed out to you when you checked in. And we are delighted to welcome him back to this podium. America is facing many challenges. Now and in the coming weeks or so, President Trump will make several decisions that could move our country from peace to war. Whether it is promised for, quote, a forceful response to the recent chemical attack in Syria, or launching another salvo in an escalating trade war with China, or the unpredictability of his dealings with Kim Jong-un, or the desertification of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, how President Trump goes about handling or mishandling any one of these will set, signify an epochal moment in American history. Accordingly, a discussion about grand strategy, about what our goals as a nation should be, and the leadership skills necessary to implement these objectives comes at just the right time. In On Grand Strategy, Professor Gaddis tells us that the adjective grand has to do with what's at stake, which is why grand strategies traditionally have been associated with the planning and fighting of wars. It is, he says, about, quote, the alignment of potentially unlimited aspirations with necessary limited capabilities, end quote. In analyzing the processes and complexities involved in devising grand strategies, our guest encourages us to not only re-examine the theories of war, diplomacy, revolutions, and great men, but to scrutinize timeless leadership lessons. In doing so, he reminds us to think about the virtues and moral compass of grand strategists and thinkers. Drawing on lessons from history and the classics, from Thucydides to Machiavelli, from the Founding Fathers to Roosevelt and Isaiah Berlin, Professor Gaddis warns us against leaders who dare to improvise and those who do not listen or learn. At a time when our nation's strategy seems elusive and monumental challenges abound, the relevance of leadership cannot be dismissed. In thinking about what is needed to safeguard our vital interests, please join me for a master class in grand strategy by giving a warm welcome to our guest today, Professor John Lewis Gaddis. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to all of you for um, coming. This is a familiar venue for me when launching a new book. I always seem to launch it here, it seems, uh, over breakfast, it seems. And uh, this has become uh, quite a comfortable pattern uh, for me, so it's good to be back uh, here. I'd like to start this morning by saying just a little bit about how this book came to be. Uh, and then from that, we can move into, perhaps in the question and answer period, whatever reflections it might uh, imply for more current uh, issues. But uh, this book was not supposed to be in the first place. When I was here uh, six years ago, I guess it was, I was launching uh, my biography of George Kennan, which I'd been working on for something like uh, 30 years. And that book had come out uh, at that point. The book did uh, pretty well. That was book number 10. And 10 being a good round number, I thought that's a good place to stop. So I told everybody I was stopping. They said, what's your next book? I said, there's not going to be one. They then said, no, no, you have to write one. You can't stop. And so many people said that, uh, that I had to come up with a cover story. <laughs> and the cover story was, OK, you're, you're right. I will do a book just for you on foxes and hedgehogs, and I was not serious uh, about this. You know. And that got me by for another two or three months or so, but to make the story credible, I actually had to do some reading up on foxes and hedgehogs and on Isaiah Berlin and all of this. Uh, and I began to get hooked myself by the animals, uh, by the foxes and the hedgehogs, and to get interested uh, in it. And so I found myself actually developing a lecture on foxes and hedgehogs, teaching a course on foxes and hedgehogs, 
and ultimately writing a book on foxes and hedgehogs. That's how these things uh, tend to happen. Part of what I got interested in with regard to this concept, you all know the distinction. The fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one big thing. And it was Isaiah Berlin who revived that old uh, principle, which goes back to the ancient Greeks. But what I found in researching the history of this is that he revived it himself as a joke. He revived it uh, as a party game in Oxford one evening, sometime back in 1939. He, they were sitting around in the commons room or something like that. And uh, uh, Berlin said, uh, let's play a game. Let's classify great writers and thinkers according to foxes and hedgehogs. And so. so the idea stuck in his mind. And after World War II, he used it as a framing device for what really is a very extended essay uh, on Tolstoy, one of his very best. Uh, and, but it, he, he called it the hedgehog and the fox. And that is what caused uh, this distinction to go viral in 1953, uh, before most other things had gone viral, thanks to social media and all of this. Uh, and uh, the concept of the fox and the hedgehog transfixed people, but for reasons uh, of which uh, they were not completely clear themselves. There was just something intriguing about this. And so uh, there has been a permanence to this uh, distinction which uh, I think can be a lesson to us all if you really are interested in durability of your own thinking, the power of your own ideas. Turn them into animals, <laughs> and they will persist uh, forever. So that's the first starting point uh, for, this, uh, for this book. The second point uh, has to do with something that tends to happen in the Yale Grand Strategy Seminar on a regular basis. I've been teaching this course now with my colleagues Paul Kennedy and Charlie Hill for about 20 years, and so I know the pattern. And what happens is when the discussion becomes very heated uh, and uh, uh, everyone turns to Professor Hill for his guidance on uh, these issues, uh, he will compose his features, draw back, and say in a, uh, a very, very serious, even ponderous way, as F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote, uh, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold contradictory ideas in the mind at the same time while retaining the ability to function. And then he stops, and he says nothing more. And the students say, Professor, oh, what did you mean by that? Nothing, a complete <laughs> poker face, you know, nothing. He just leaves it hanging over the summer. I finally got tired of this uh, and decided I had to try to work through that idea. And in fact, it paralleled very nicely the fox and the hedgehog, because uh, I think Berlin himself was both in many ways, certainly by temperament, he tilted toward being a fox. But at the same time, he was profoundly conscious of the need for a, some central direction, for some sense of strategy. And so I think in his own life, in his own thinking, in his own writing, uh, he is both a fox uh, and a hedgehog. And late in life, when interviewed on this, when pressed on this, uh, he actually admitted, yes, it's uh, uh, really bright people are both. But then the question comes up, how do you know when to be which? That, I said, never quite got around to somehow. And so that was my third question uh, coming into this uh, project. And so very much in the spirit of Isaiah Berlin, just picking profound things up from very casual uh, occasions, I went to see a movie. Uh, my wife and I went to see Lincoln in 2012, Steven Spielberg's great uh, movie. And about two thirds of the way through, those of you who've seen the movie will remember that in the heat of the debate in the House of Representatives in 1865 over the 13th Amendment, which is abolishing slavery for all time to come, Tommy Lee Jones, playing Thaddeus Stevens, confronts uh, Lincoln, played by Day Lewis, and upbraids him for the political and uh, uh, certainly moral compromises that he is making in forcing this bill through the House of Representatives. By this time, it's been demonstrated that Lincoln has employed bribery, coercion, deception, uh, uh, patronage handing out post offices all over the country, right and left, to get this thing through. Uh, 
everything short of murder itself. Uh, Abe has tried uh, to get this bill through the House of Representatives. And this is shown very nicely uh, in the movie. And in the dialogue in the screenplay, which is written by Tony Kushner, uh, Lincoln uh, looks down at Stevens and reminiscence, reminiscence about his days as a surveyor. And he points out that as a surveyor, it was very handy for him to have a compass, because how otherwise would you know true north? But in fact, if all you do is follow the compass, uh, you're apt to wind up in a swamp, or falling over a cliff, or in a desert, or something. Um, so what Lincoln was saying is that you have to consult the compass and maintain situational awareness, as we would call it today. Look at what's around you. See where you're going. Uh, and not just keep that distant view as the only thing uh, that's in your mind. And this was, as they say, an epiphany for me. As I say in the book, I actually had the spooky sense that Isaiah Berlin was right there in the next seat in the movie theater. Uh, <laughs> just uh, say, ah, you see, you see, you see. Uh, and uh, that was the, uh, it's as if it had been written to address Penn. I don't think it was, and there's no authenticity to this particular Lincoln quote. It's a fake quote, but it's characteristic of how Lincoln thought, it seems to me. And so that was my third way into this book. So um, first, animals, secondly, uh, uh, Fitzgerald contradictions, and third, going to see a movie. This is what produced uh, the book. Um, what is the book about in the first place? Well, first of all, the book is about teaching, or it's about the reflections of teaching, or perhaps maybe, for me, the intellectual fruits of teaching. Because we have been doing this course for so long uh, at Yale. And because the way we have designed the course, it's a year-long course, but the first semester has always been devoted to the great classical texts. We think there is some reason for reading the classics. There is some reason why people keep coming back to the classics repeatedly. Different ages, different cultures find things of value in some of these ancient texts. And without trying to be too precise as to what those things are, we just thought our curriculum should start with that. And it always has and still does. So uh, what I thought it would be interesting to write about was just my own progress through our curriculum. Uh, one of the great advantages of teaching, as those of you who have done it well, would certainly know, is that it teaches the teacher sometimes more than it actually teaches the student. Uh, and that has certainly been the case uh, with me. I am a Cold War historian, primarily. I've never worked on the ancient world or on intellectual history uh, before. So I'm a total amateur at these subjects. But I do know something about how they work in the classroom. And what I wanted to do was to get on paper, while there's still time, uh, some sense of what these teaching activities for us have um, been over a long period of time. So hence the book, and hence the case studies. Some of them are case studies that we have regularly used in the class, like Thucydides and Machiavelli and Clausewitz. Some of them are case studies that we never had time to get around to, like Herodotus. Some are case studies that occasionally drop out of the course, but then come back in, like Elizabeth uh, and Philip. Some are strange connections that I found myself making in the process of writing the book. So <clears throat> I, have a, I have a chapter called Souls and States in which uh, St. Augustine and Machiavelli are in the same chapter and are actually talking to each other, despite the fact that they were separated by a 1,000 years or so. Uh, so I thought that would be fun to set up. And similarly, I have a chapter on Clausewitz, which started out being a chapter on Clausewitz, but very quickly got taken over by Tolstoy. And uh, the common thread is both were combat officers, both knew the nature of war on the ground. Clausewitz, from direct involvement, uh, in uh, the campaign against Napoleon in 1812. Tolstoy from fighting in the Crimea and in the Caucasus in the 1850s, but drawing on that knowledge as he wrote War and Peace, which of course uh, focuses on that great event. And so uh, I have Clausewitz and Tolstoy, uh, as I put it in the book, finishing each other's sentences. Because they actually do, if you set Clausewitz's great work on war against Tolstoy's greatest work, War and Peace, the uh, parallels are uncanny. Uh, 
Yes, of course, you have to read through, let's see, a total of probably 2,000 pages uh, to see the parallels. <laughs> But because I teach those texts, you know, this was not difficult to do, and so it was fun to write about these as well. I had one other specification for this book, and that was that I did not want it to say, I didn't want to say anything about the Cold War. I have that kind of weird feeling that you all know, been there, done that. I'm not sure that I would have anything new to say at this point about the Cold War. And so I decided to stop with World War II and with Franklin D. Roosevelt, who certainly is one of my heroes as a, a perfect, or almost perfect, grand strategist, and uh, not do current events at all uh, this time around. And part of the, there are several different reasons for this, one of which is cowardice, no, no question about that. Uh, but one of which also is timeliness. If you focus too much on the current period, that's going to date the book in time. The book will seem out of date. And I've seen this with some of the other things that I've written in the past. If you stop before you get to the current, maybe it will last longer. Maybe it will stick longer in people's minds. Maybe it itself will take on halfway timeless uh, characteristics. And so that was my argument for stopping some 70 years into the past and just saying, here it is, draw for yourself your own conclusions as to how it applies to the present uh, and to the future. That's what we ask our students uh, to do. We try not to tell them uh, what conclusions to draw, but we simply encourage them to draw those conclusions. And that really is what I would like to encourage you to do, is to draw your own conclusions when you have a chance to read the book. To what extent is this a book about timeless principles? If those principles are timeless, how do you think they apply to our time? Uh, and to how do you think they might apply to future times? And then thinking that through, how would you, if you were a teacher, uh, train uh, young people now for a future that lies before them, which they cannot see and we cannot see either. We cannot come close to seeing it. Think of just the extent to which we've been surprised ourselves by the last four or five years and then think about the possibilities for a surprise that lie ahead. And ask yourself, what then is going to be the compass heading in these swamps, in these, uh, to guard against these cliffs, these deserts? And I think the compass heading, uh, the most likely one that we can uh, uh, rely on, one of the very few available to us, are the great classical texts. Um, they have been around for a very long time. There's every reason to think because of this, they will continue to be around for a very long time. They will continue to be read. And maybe that's the best we can do in thinking ahead. So I'd like to conclude, if possible, by just encouraging you to have another sweet roll and a little more coffee uh, and to think about timeless principles as they might apply to the situations with which this organization is concerned and with which I know all of you are concerned. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think that should be our main uh, activity this morning, is a dialogue. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. But before I open it up, maybe you could elaborate and tell us what you found to be some of the timeless principles. Oh. <laughs> Which... <coughs> I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, that, <laughs> that would be too didactic. That would be too instructional. Let me just mention one. Uh, which uh, is so obvious that uh, you know, it, seems, uh, it seems pedestrian to say this. And yet, <coughs> uh, I think it is so often overlooked uh, that it's pretty fundamental. The principle is this. Aspirations can be anything. They can be infinite. They can be whatever is in your imagination. They can be Xerxes in chapter one, uh, proposing to invade not just Greece, but all of Europe and perhaps maybe um, uh, the skies as well, Zeus's um, skies uh, as well. Capabilities can never be infinite. Capabilities are always finite. Uh, these are boots on the ground. They are supplies. They are uh, logistics. They are geography. They are environment. The classic case for me is precisely the Persian invasion of Greece in 480, the, book, the point with which I start the book. And I talk about uh, Xerxes' great bridges across the Hellespont, the pontoon bridges. I talk about his great armies that were there. Uh, 
I talk about him looking down. Herodotus gives us all of this on those armies uh, up there. And uh, I talk about the dialogue that Herodotus gives us in those pages of his great history. The advisor who turns to Xerxes and says, Sire, are you sure? Are you really sure you want to do this? Invading Greece, all these millions, of, not millions, but thousands, tens of thousands of troops. He says, if you invade Greece, you will uh, find that your supply lines are stretched. You will find that the armies are drinking rivers dry before they finish crossing them. You will find that there are surprises along the way. You will find all kinds of resistance long before the Greeks themselves begin to mount any resistance. And Xerxes arrogantly says to his advisor, if I had to think about all these things, I would never do anything. <laughs> and that is true. If you have to think about everything, you may well paralyze yourself into inactivity. But it's also true, if you don't think about these things, you get into trouble. And so Xerxes' supply lines were stretched. The rivers were dry before the armies crossed. Uh, unexpectedly, there were lions in the mountains of Macedonia, which came down and ate his camels, the supply camels, and so on. Uh, finally, at the crucial Battle of Salamis, the naval battle after uh, Xerxes had captured and burned Athens, it suddenly emerged that while the Greeks were very uh, accomplished uh, sailors, uh, and so were the Persians. But the problem for the Persian sailors is that nobody had bothered to teach them to swim. Well, you know, you have to think about these things. These are details. These are tiny details. None of them are rocket science. You, uh, anybody could have said, these are going to be the problems. The advisors uh, said this. But Xerxes, uh, in his hedgehog-like determination just to flatten everything that got in the way, was brushing these things aside. And I think so often uh, that that tends to happen uh, because uh, qualifications, details, problems like that seem to be weights impeding what the great project that you may have. And so the tendency is to sweep them aside, but they are the things that often uh, impede your progress or maybe even frustrate the ultimate objective. Well, this is an opportunity for all of you to turn back time and enter the seminar <laughs> with John Gaddis. So okay. raise your hand and ask your all questions. Right. All I ask is that you identify yourself and keep your questions mm -hmm. brief. We'll start right over here. It's about Eastern, uh, Eastern political philosophy. So mm -hmm. It's intriguing to me that you have a country which was the world's most populous, mm -hmm. great nation, mm -hmm. put into eclipse about 250 years ago mm -hmm. when the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. started in the West, mm -hmm. and now is perhaps taking its historic place in the world. Mm -hmm. But yet there doesn't seem to be much discussion of the question of strategy that mm -hmm. emanated from that environment or from that culture, and I'm wondering if you might comment on that. There's a problem with language here. The Chinese grand strategic tradition and that body of literature is immense, uh, actually, and the Chinese have over the years had the concept of grand strategy and have written about it. But most of it is still, as yet, as I understand it, untranslated. Uh, we do have Sun Tzu, and in fact, there is a discussion of Sun Tzu in the book. And in fact, we teach Sun Tzu as part of the course that we do uh, at Yale. And you suddenly begin to see a kind of different mentality at work. Because if you read Sun Tzu, you see that it's a book of precepts. It's not a history. It's uh, not theory. It's just uh, precepts. Uh, and uh, the precepts will be something like this. Uh, water tends to run downhill. And then there's a moment of silence, and the students all look at each other, and they say, well, didn't we know that? Is that profound? Is this strategy? You know, what is this? You know? But then they read the next line, and Sun Tzu says, and armies must do the same thing. And so what you have here is Sun Tzu anticipating what I was saying about situational awareness, about the importance in any military operation of taking into account the terrain the importance of getting uh, gravity on your side, the importance of leverage. Uh, and this is something Xerxes totally ignored in invading uh, Greece. And so in two sentences, Sun Tzu has become, I think, both hedgehog and fox without ever hearing those, those terms. And so one of the things that fascinates me is the extent to which different cultures seem to come to the same ideas independently of each other. And I would like to see
as a project for major universities and think tanks. Uh, some more systematic effort, first of all, to retrieve those classics that are still inaccessible to most of us because of the language, but then to think more systematically about the cross-cultural comparisons uh, of these, for sure. Don Simmons, uh, a follow-on question. Um, China uh, is now in a strategically expanding mm -hmm. posture, mm -hmm. but seemingly um, limited, at least so far, to its region and to those areas that have been historically connected or arguably mm -hmm. connected. Um, six centuries ago, when they had a chance to bring military conquest to, uh, mm -hmm. to the Indian Ocean and right. East Africa, mm -hmm. they didn't. Yep. And I'm wondering what you would you expect them in the coming decades mm -hmm. to remain mm -hmm. focused on their region or mm -hmm. become more global? Well, I know that uh, 15th century decision to cease exploration has always been an immensely puzzling decision to us because the explorations would have been far more massive than anything that the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, mounted. But before we get too puzzled on this, we should ask, uh, maybe ask ourselves, why uh, some four uh, decades ago or so, uh, the United States seemed poised to colonize the moon. And then it seems to have forgotten that the moon is there. What has happened to our great expedition in that regard? So uh, before one says this is too completely weird or too completely uh, curious, it's good to look in the mirror at uh, you know, some of these principles and try to um, learn from the comparisons that can come uh, from that as well. Yes, the long Chinese tradition has been one of expansion and contraction, but uh, within, within that region, uh, the possibility of doing this on a global scale has never really been developed uh, by the uh, Chinese. But the Chinese have not had the wealth and the technology that is available to them uh, now. The Chinese have not been in a position of really uh, competitive, uh, uh, almost competitive overtaking of the West in certain critical areas like artificial intelligence, which we had a conference on at Yale uh, last weekend, inspired by Henry Kissinger, who is deeply interested uh, in, this, in this topic. And so uh, what the Chinese may do in the future to assume that they will always be bound by their own cultural tradition, again, is something we should look into the mirror about, because there might have been those who would have said, in the 19th century, Americans will always be bound by their isolationist tradition, their uh, habit of staying within their region, their own boundaries, and then look what happened. Uh, so these are good starting points for analysis. But again, situational awareness is critical. You have to factor in the new variables that are created, particularly by technological progress, uh, which is um, uh, rarely reversible. Sometimes it is, but rarely. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Felix, uh, if someone were to find themselves president of the United States or head of state, mm -hmm. do they necessarily need to arrive at the office with a big vision Mm -hmm. for grand strategy, or could they develop one through the interaction with advisors mm -hmm. and the resources? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, if you were advising that person, what are the few things you would tell them to do yeah, uh, to sure. create a, a grand yeah. strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think on the one hand, it would be desirable for them to have a compass heading, yes. Uh, I think on the other hand, uh, that rarely happens because they come to power preoccupied with other things like how do you get power in the first place, and that's a political problem, domestic political problem, uh, it, it seems to me. Um, and on the business of what you bring to power, this again gets around to Kissinger and what he said famously years ago about intellectual capital. Uh, a leader entering into a great position of responsibility uh, can only draw on the capital that he or she has brought to that position. And often that capital has been uh, invested uh, decades ago in education, for example. And uh, that's, uh, you don't have time as you're rising within some organization, as you're competing with rivals. And then certainly as you, you are president of the United States to sit around and re-educate yourself in the great classical text, there just is not time uh, to do this. 
So this has been one of the elements uh, in our thinking. We've always been influenced by that Kissinger quote. And we've thought of our course as a long-term investment in the future of our students. We can't know what they're going to be doing. Uh, I mean, I know what they'll be doing for the first two, two years or so, which is working for a hedge fund, but they won't stay there. <laughs> um, and uh, they'll be doing other things uh, after that. Uh, and there's certainly no way to, con to imagine what crises they might confront 20 years out or so. Um, but I think we can show them patterns, uh, nonetheless. I think we can plant in their minds the seeds of concepts which uh, they will remember because we have their attention now as undergraduate. We will not have their attention when they are rising, when they're uh, at the hedge fund, when they're uh, on the way to political uh, eminence or notoriety or whatever that may be. Uh, so they draw, they will draw, on the capital that we provide them. And I think we have to be very careful about what that capital is. I don't think that capital should be short term, very specific, overly specialized, or even overly theoretical uh, uh, concepts because it seems to me all of those um, micro history um, deterministic theory have been shown to be not very relevant to operational circumstances. But I think an instinct for how to wield power is something that is uh, transferable. And I don't think it always requires education. I'm impressed, again, as always, with Lincoln, who had less than one year of formal education. But no one has intuited classical grand strategic logic better, it seems to me, uh, than Lincoln. You could say it's just common sense. And of course it is. It is just common sense. But think how uncommon common sense uh, is. Uh, the psychologist Phil Tetlock did a very revealing study, which some of you may know, um, about, uh, began it about 20 years ago checking on the accuracy of prediction of public intellectuals. And uh, he tracked that over a very long period of time and was looking for what explains accuracy in prediction. And nothing worked. It didn't matter whether people were liberal or conservative or Democrat, uh, Republican, male, female, whatever. The only variable that worked was when Phil asked the leaders to rank themselves on the scale as either fox or hedgehog. Uh, and he gave them Isaiah Berlin's uh, definitions of those terms. And he said the result was, it's in his book, the result is startling. The foxes were far better at prediction uh, than the hedgehogs. The hedgehogs had a record of accuracy that approximated statistically that of a dart-throwing chimpanzee. Uh, and yet, he noticed, the hedgehogs tended to rise faster in organizations, and they tended to go to the top of their organizations and whatnot. And why was that? Well, it's because they had one big idea. And if you think about our media today and what it prizes, what it prizes are sound bites, the ability within 30 seconds or so before the next commercial to give you one big idea. And if you sit there in front of a television camera and say, on the one hand this, but gosh, on the other hand that, and well, I can't quite make up my mind on this even, you will either be cut off or at least not invited back, you see. Uh, so uh, there is a paradox uh, somehow that the one big idea, even though we know that this is a problematic way of thinking about the, the future, uh, does seem to be uh, uh, more powerful in career uh, advancement. Uh, than the qualifications that foxes do. So is there a principle that lies behind this? Uh, Ted like didn't say, but I have tried to articulate one in the book, and maybe this is one of the few succinct ideas that comes out of this book. It's a riddle. Why is common sense like oxygen? Because the higher you go, the thinner it gets. <laughs> Thank you. My name is George Paik. Um, principles. Uh, how timeless or time resilient is the principle of individual liberty, by which I'm thinking of, if you will, individuals cap the growth of individuals' capabilities to pursue their aspirations? And I ask in the context of, and, and it's another question, is it fair to call that the core of, sorry, America's best traditions? And I'm citing Ken in there. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. I think looking at world history, as we have to do in answering a question like that, 
I would say that the concept of individual liberty is uh, irregularly represented, no matter what period in world history uh, you're talking about. I don't think there is a great historical movement, uh, a Hegelian um, undercurrent tectonic force moving toward uh, individual liberty. I'm not a Fukuyamaist or um, anything like that. What I'm struck by is the importance of culture as a center of gravity. And some cultures are more uh, sympathetic to individual liberty than other cultures are. So uh, am I surprised by Putin in China and the rise of authoritarianism, uh, uh, sorry, in Russia and the rise of authoritarianism there? Am I surprised by Xi in China and what's happening there? Anybody who's read Chinese or Russian history, I think, should not be uh, surprised. Because these traditions go back, far back earlier than the communist revolutions that took place in both of those uh, cultures. And I think uh, one of the things that we have to do is respect these cultural traditions and realize that certain societies uh, in the world whether for reasons of uh, geography or vulnerability or religion or any number of other variables, think about these issues differently from the way that we do. And I think we have to uh, include that within this uh, um, um, zone of capabilities that we bring to the formulation of strategy. If you try to impose a culture, an American libertarian culture, on a society like China, or in a place like the Middle East, or in dealing with Russia. Um, you're facing an uphill battle, and Sun Tzu says you shouldn't do that. You should make everything a downhill battle so that you take advantage of the natural center of gravity that's, that's there. Now, these kinds of things go back and forth, and of course, there's no hard and fast rule here. But we ought to be thinking about overall default positions, tendencies uh, that are there. And culture is a huge one. And just back off that for a minute and think about how uh, the uh, liberal community, not just in this country, but in Europe and elsewhere, has thought about culture uh, over the last, uh, in the years since the Cold War ended. Uh, we tend to say culture is no longer very important. We are in a globalized world, a flat earth, if I may coin a phrase. Uh, and uh, that uh, we can assume that there is a global movement toward individual liberty. Well, I think we've been shaken. I know we've been shaken in that assumption in the last five years or so. This is going to be regarded as a very interesting historical period. But a kind of comeuppance to American arrogance in the aftermath of the Cold War. But not something, again, that requires rocket science. All it requires is reading history. Uh, Jim Traub, uh, I remember uh, after 9-11 uh, that you gave a series of lectures, which was then turned into a, a mm -hmm. book, uh, where you made the intriguing point that uh, the historic pattern in the United States mm -hmm. is that after being attacked, the mm -hmm. United States, rather than seeking shelter, mm -hmm. strikes back, mm -hmm. expands. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you said that these concepts that uh, Bush was then being mm -hmm. Uh, criticized for mm -hmm. unilateralism, preemption, mm -hmm. and so forth. Actually, we're very much in the American tradition. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious now with 16 years of mm -hmm. retrospect, mm -hmm. uh, how you feel about that now. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the problems with writing a book on current affairs is that you almost always regret it later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't terribly regret that book. I think it was mostly on target with its uh, long-term historical uh, um, conclusions. Uh, comparing Bush 43 to Henry V was a little bit much. That was a little bit over the top, but nonetheless. Um, but, uh, you know, for, uh, yeah, I certainly was not, uh, people say it was a pro-Iraq war book, and maybe it was in balance, but it certainly was pointing out some of the problems that we were apt to run into. So I mostly would stand by it. But I don't think that's what I do. Primarily, I don't think that's my role. There are plenty of other people, a lot of people in this room, who do that. I think my role is to uh, actually teach history uh, and try to provide young people with the kind of grounding in these very long-term perspectives that would allow them uh, to be better prepared to deal with uh, policy issues. Uh, the, that book, Surprise, Security, and the American Experience, it's also a dated book. It was dated uh, almost immediately after it came out, and that's what tends to happen. Such books have short shelf lives, really. Um, so I'm hoping that this one, 
which decidedly and carefully tries to avoid commenting on the present, uh, might wear better uh, than, than that one did. Thanks. Reed, Reed Bonadonna. Uh, Professor, I've been reading your book, but I haven't gotten to the chapter yet on, on Clausewitz and Tolstoy, so I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by, by that. And, That's uh, the best chapter in the book. Is it? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I, and as a former combat arms officer, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of mm -hmm. their experience as, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as combat arms officers. And I know that in your class, you teach some active duty Army and Marine Corps officers, and we also do. some of the students at Yale are mm -hmm. in the ROTC program. We'll be going to Very the, much so. the Navy and the Marine Corps after they. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, first of all, what what these guys bring, mm -hmm. uh, going back to Tolstoy and Clausewitz, and mm -hmm. and and what you think they're they're getting mm -hmm. out of uh, out mm -hmm. of your course mm -hmm. in in particular, because I'm mm -hmm. I'm interested in officer education, mm -hmm. which which goes on by the way throughout a career PME, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't stop at the graduate level. Okay. Um, and I, another sort of unfair question, I wonder if you've ever read the book um, Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman. Yes. Uh, reading it, I've yep. constantly reminded of Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think in some ways he out Tolstoy's. Uh, Tolstoy. And, I, wouldn't, and, I wouldn't go that far. No? But, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, well, I think the conditions under which it yeah. were read, yeah. Uh, yeah. under which it was written, were, yeah. were, were yeah. so uh, yeah. adverse. But anyway, any, yeah. any comments at all about um, that tradition of combat arms officers uh, as thinkers in your classroom? Well, I would just say, first of all, that that tradition of combat arms officers is, fundam is actually fundamental in this comparison that I'm making of Clausewitz and Tolstoy for the reasons I mentioned. And it seems to me to reread those great books with the knowledge that these were both people who knew the face of battle on the ground and who both describe it in absolutely parallel ways uh, is extremely important. Uh, one of the things a combat arms officer learns from uh, combat is that uh, training is exceedingly valuable in going into combat. Uh, but once you're into combat, there's no manual that you can rely on. You, know, you have to relate your previous training to completely unexpected things, which uh, Clausewitz called friction, as you know. And Tolstoy is full of friction. And uh, so it's that intersection of training with uh, surprise that I think is so critical in uh, Clausewitz. And I think that's a more sophisticated view of theory than the way theory is normally taught and conceived of and written uh, today. Because it's a theory about when not to have a theory. And in life, uh, there are many points in which theories are useful, but there are also many points in which you just have to throw out the theory and assess the reality. And, uh, just on the officers in the classroom, it's been a great benefit to us. Simply, uh, when we started, simply having them present in the classroom. Because uh, we were startled, this is before ROTC came back to Yale, we were startled uh, at how few uh, of our students, our undergrads, had had any experience with anyone ever in the military. And so to have uh, a, a light colonel or a full colonel come and just sit in the classroom and uh, um, go to Maury's with the students or uh, God knows where else, maybe Toad's, uh, you know, with the students, um, it was immensely educational. There was kind of kind of culture uh, transfer there that we could not have done ourselves, but those guys did it. But then the whole mood on campus has changed since ROTC came back uh, to Yale, and now we have uh, students walking around a campus on certain days in full uniform. There's nobody objects to this. Everybody welcomes the presence of well, not everybody. There are a few diehard faculty who don't, but otherwise it's, it is faculty only. You know? Uh, and it's a completely different uh, mood. So uh, the interaction is much smoother now than it was then. Then it was just two cultures learning about each other, but I think now they know more about each other. And there's more genuine uh, dialogue and interaction uh, that takes place as a result of it. Whatever it is, it's immensely healthy uh, for Yale and for other universities to have that presence uh, on, on campus. And we're very happy to have played some role um, in that. For sure. Sidhu. Uh, Sidhu, uh, I cannot resist the temptation of asking the preeminent uh, historian on the Cold War, uh, how would you characterize the scenario where we are today? Uh, mm -hmm. Would you call it the new Cold War? Would you call it Cold War 2.0? Would you call it something else entirely? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's call it something else. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, there have been Cold Wars throughout history. 
if you define Cold War in lower letters, not capital letters, as simply a, a persistent uh, and sometimes very, very uh, tense conflict that still does not erupt into a hot war, uh, uh, then this is nothing new. There's a long tradition of this having happened. Uh, and um, so uh, I think we need to look at what was distinctive about the Cold War itself. What was distinctive about the Cold War with capital letters, it seems to me, was the ideological dimension, the ideological divide, the fact that uh, this was a, a conflict, a very long conflict, about ideas uh, originating with Marx and Lenin. And one of the things that we have found uh, is how seriously the Soviet and Chinese leadership took ideology. We had often thought that it was just window dressing. But you cannot read, uh, for example, Steve Kotkin's great biography of Stalin, uh, now uh, with third volume uh, approaching, uh, and take ideology lightly because it shows uh, to what extent, uh, almost with blinding effects, it, uh, it shaped uh, even Stalin, who was no great intellectual, but also a very complex figure. So uh, the, uh, there's nothing like that today. There's no guiding ideology other than uh, authoritarian, authoritarianism, which is really more of a cultural tradition, it seems to me, in Russia and in the other places. There's no common ideology uh, uh, guiding these things. What's guiding them uh, is, I think, a backlash against globalization in each of these countries, if you include uh, immigration as a manifestation of global uh, globalization. Certainly that's what's going on uh, in Europe and places like Hungary, for example. So uh, that would be my answer. No, it's not the Cold War as I wrote about it. But yes, it's a kind of Cold War of the kind that have, uh, kinds that have happened many times before in, in history. Yeah, hmm? uh, uh, Korean mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we are dealing with the North Korean issue. Well, mm -hmm. I, I was quite impressed by the timeless principle. Actually, the gap between aspiration and mm -hmm. capability mm -hmm. actually is applied to our happiness too, right? Mm -hmm. It's the bigger the gap and then we are right. unhappy. Yeah. But actually, the things about North Korean issue as we're like, our aspiration is really we want to dismantle their nuclear capability as mm -hmm. soon as possible, but mm -hmm. the reality the capabilities mm -hmm. not and a lot of mm -hmm. conflicting mm -hmm. issues so I just want to hear your perspective yeah. yeah well I'm I'm not an expert on this subject in any way but I would I would say should our primary objective be to dismantle their nuclear capability I mean that's the way Americans think about this but I imagine if you could uh, bring the North Koreans in today and give them breakfast here and whatnot uh, they'd be grateful of course uh, you, you know, uh, I think you would find uh, that uh, they would see it differently. They would say there's got to be some objective beyond that. Possibly it's a political objective. Possibly it's a cultural objective. Um, I think it would be reunification of all Koreans in one country, in one place. Uh, and I suspect that's powerfully motivating the North Koreans. And I suspect it also in a different way is powerful motivating the, the South Koreans. So nuclear weapons are just one part of that um, equation. And I think far too often we in the States confuse process with objectives. So to say that we are uh, seeking to de uh, um, uh, denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, that's a process. What's it leading to? Is it leading to stability? Well, nobody really thinks much about that in the first place. It's seen as a, an objective in itself. Take NATO expansion. Uh, which was, uh, and NATO itself was always a process leading toward a larger objective, which was the balance of power, restoration of the balance of power in, in Europe. So when people say, as they do incessantly, our uh, uh, supreme goal must be to ensure the uh, solidity and credibility of the NATO alliance, I have a lot of trouble with that because that's confusing process with objective. Uh, a man from Mars coming in, woman from Mars coming in, whoever it is who comes in from Mars, <laughs> looking at NATO as a military alliance, would I think say, uh, should your boundaries really be uh, so exposed as those of the Baltic republics and some of the Eastern European? Would you have designed an alliance like this to begin with, as opposed to uh, 
applying the Sun Tzu principle of taking advantage of the landscape and finding the defensible positions and not trying to defend the indefensible positions. No, I don't think so. But the process has carried us that far. And I think something like that perhaps has happened with globalization as well. We became so infatuated with that process that we didn't look at the backlash. And uh, I, uh, some of you know, I come from Texas, so I know something about backlashes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I taught for years uh, in the Middle West, and so I, you know, I saw a backlash coming 20 years ago against globalization, against free trade. That was pretty obvious in southeastern Ohio. How that could not have been seen uh, better and more clearly uh, among the elites' uh, establishments uh, on both coasts and so on is something we need to look into and think very hard about, for sure. Uh, good morning, Professor. My name is Kevin McMullen. Mm -hmm. I have a pedagogical question. Yes, sir. Is why Clausewitz instead of Jomini? Every okay. senior service school in the military assigns Clausewitz, mm -hmm. but simultaneously warns the students that it's not a finished work. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so is Jomini Gem is not a finished work either. He thought it was finished, but it was not the full picture. Uh, it's too geometrical. It's uh, too inclined to reduce uh, strategy to a matter of um, fortifications, calculations, uh, all of this. It certainly was the dominant influence at West Point in the 19th century before, there, uh, before Clausewitz had even been translated uh, into uh, English uh, as well. And it's probably still read. I don't doubt that it is in some of the war colleges. But the great difference is that uh, Germany was really um, uh, had a single lens of analysis. If you do this, then um, the following will result. And it was kind of like a football coach drawing the diagram of a play up on the blackboard and just saying, that's it, guys. That's what's going to happen. You know, uh, None of it is up to you. I've already determined what's going to happen because I put the plan up on the blackboard. You see. Well, it doesn't work that way in real life. And, um, this is where the genius of Lincoln was, because Lincoln himself, with no uh, education, came closer to thinking about and devising a strategy for defeating the Confederacy than any of his West Point uh, generals did, with the uh, exception, finally, of Grant. But think how long it took Lincoln to get to Grant. And what Lincoln said, basically, um, yes, we need to think about military deployments, but we need to think also about the disparities of power that lie behind those deployments. And the South cannot bring to bear the level of industrial technology and uh, economic resources and natural resources that the North can bring to bear. In the end, that will wear the South down. So we just have to find strategies that apply that those continental resources to a regional problem in, uh, of secession. It was as simple as that. Lincoln always had this continental vision, thinking of the entire continent. Why did he, uh, right in the middle of the Civil War, uh, insist on building the Transcontinental Railroad? It's an extraordinary act. Why the land uh, grant colleges in that, in that period? Uh, so there's an extraordinary looking ahead. Uh, he even talks in one of his messages to Congress about the 20th century and what the United States is going to be like at that point. And he says, we are going to be a world power. And if we stay together, we will have the capacity in many ways to shape the world. Uh, and that's where the concept of the last best hope that he articulated came from. Uh, so it, it's, it's amazing to me uh, how um, an academic could have been as narrow as Germany was compared to a non-academic who's profoundly uh, grand strategic in terms of thinking about um, the big things, a lot of big things at once, but also thinking about the overall sense of direction and not getting bogged down or distracted by processes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Jim Alchel. Don't want to pick an argument with you, but okay. since you, um, you mentioned a little while ago that we should not be surprised that um, China and Russia are being ruled by authoritarian governments mm -hmm. or taking an authoritarian turn because of their history and culture. Mm -hmm. But um, if that is your belief, and I'm not arguing with it, but how do you explain what appears to be the success and democracy taking root in South Korea and Taiwan? Mm 
Um, the Cold War had a lot to do with that. Um, in South Korea, we occupied it for a long time. And then we were in a position, even after we were no longer physically occupying it, to support it for a very long time and to protect it for even longer time. Uh, so uh, South Korea is a part of the world that we uh, began paying attention to by inadvertence. It was not part of the original American designation of vital interest in the Cold War. But once the attack occurred, uh, it, it became a vital interest or we made it a vital interest. And it seems to me there and in Germany on a larger scale and in Japan on a larger scale, uh, the, what happened was uh, the, the benefits of just long-term military operation or uh, occupation on the one hand, but something else that's there, which was always something worse out there. If you didn't put up with the Americans, think who you were going to have to put up with, uh, and that was a powerful incentive to cooperate. It certainly worked well in Western Europe. Um, in many ways, uh, Stalin himself is the most powerful architect of the Marshall Plan. It should be called the Stalin Plan. Um, don't tell Dan Kurtz, or don't tell uh, Ben Steele, who's just written a book about this. Um, so uh, uh, that, uh, that would be my, my sense uh, of this. You have to uh, regard, you have to see these situations as um, lodged in time and affected by time and by circumstance. And that they would automatically repeat in a very different geopolitical environment, I think, is, is not guaranteed by any means. So. Mm -hmm. Last question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Ron, Ron Berenbaim, mm -hmm. uh, looking back on your many years of mm -hmm. teaching, you remarked on the presence of the military mm -hmm. uh, or the ROTC on campus mm -hmm. and how they're now uh, greeted in a friendly way mm -hmm. as they ought to be. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of the uh, common critique that the campuses, particularly the quote unquote elite campuses mm -hmm. in which one would have to mm -hmm. include Yale, mm -hmm. much as I resent it. Uh, I don't know whether to say thanks or not. Uh, <laughs> What do you think of the argument made by people who call themselves conservatives mm -hmm. that uh, the uh, elite thought has been captured mm -hmm. by a mm -hmm. liberal fake yeah. history? Well, I'm not sure I want to go so far as to call it fake history, but I would say that uh, there is something to the critique. There's quite a lot to the critique because there's no question that uh, uh, liberal politics are far more popular uh, on all of the major Ivy League uh, campuses uh, than would be conservative uh, politics. There's no question that the curriculum has been tilted uh, toward uh, what I would call uh, uh, liberal concerns, particularly in my department, classes on uh, courses on race, class, and gender, which now heavily dominate uh, the curriculum. There are all kinds of courses on that. Is there a course in American diplomatic history? No, not at Yale. Is there a course in American diplomatic history at Princeton? No. Um, is there one at Harvard? I'm not sure. Uh, and um, so when a university, when a great university is abdicating its responsibility to cover what is obviously part of history, uh, I think there's some serious problems that we have to uh, address. Uh, to what extent does this influence or affect the students? Well, you read a lot about certain kinds of students in the media who make themselves available to the media, you see. But not all students are that way, and I know quite a number of them. And I can tell you that the great preponderance of them uh, are healthy, are open to diverse uh, points of view, and they take diversity broadly enough to mean not just race, class, and gender but diversities in politics uh, as well, in viewpoints uh, as well. And sometimes uh, they are reacting uh, very much against the prevailing view on campus. Now there's one other thing. They are social animals, of course. Uh, and uh, they are on Facebook and Twitter and uh, all the appropriate social media. And they're very concerned not to be lonely. That's a huge concern uh, at Yale. Uh, as I think it is at most uh, universities uh, these days. Uh, and so not being lonely often means appearing to go with the crowd. And so you're not going to find too many uh, uh, freshmen or sophomores at Yale uh, 
who will stick out and proudly identify themselves as card-carrying conservatives. There are always one or two who write for the Daily News uh, while I'm at. But um, I know from talking to them directly and personally and privately uh, that their viewpoints are much broader uh, than that. So I'm not so worried about the snowflakes as uh, a lot of other people uh, are. I think they're pretty resilient kids. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much, Brian. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.